Okay, so welcome to what is probably one of the most contentious classes I can cover in this series. Why are the Dunkirks contentious? Well, oh my lord. Let's see, they're built by the French, they're the first decent battleships they build, but they are... They are built within the full framing of treaty limitations, including those which are theorized limitations. And yes, I have been given a bottle of milk to finish off. Apparently the fridge is too full. So, hey ho. Milk and all iron brew. They start off their design program really in the 1920s and one of the interesting things you see when you start looking into this class looking at the history behind them is the range of assumptions the French government and the French Navy are making about a future war about their likely future opponents there's actually a shift in design philosophy when they think they're going to be fighting the Italians versus the Germans and then the Italians again they're just caught between the two and yet still they produce some of the finest battleships which have been designed and please note the choice of word there fine finest they are beautiful, they are graceful, they have great looks, they have great style, they have great poise and presence. Not necessarily saying they're the best. Honestly, in a fight, they would run away from an Elrod. They would have nowhere to stand versus a King George V or, honestly, any battleship. Pretty much from a Queen, uh, our class, Queen Elizabeth, there isn't a single American battleship which I can't think of which couldn't, if they decided to hang around and fight them, actually beat them. But that doesn't stop them being one of the finest designs ever produced. That's also one of the reasons why people sometimes call them a battle cruiser, but we'll get into that debate as we go along. First of all, shameless book plug. This is out now. The second edition, the payback is out. And it's a great thing. It is out. Well, it will be out when this comes out. I don't think it is out. I think it came out on the 30th of October. Thank you to everyone who supports the channel. Thank you to everyone who's bought the books. It's... It, nothing, none of my life, in terms of being a historian, would be viable without the support. It just wouldn't be. Oh, that's where that went. Sorry. Lost this earlier while building a Porsche. I was wondering where it went. So the background. Well, this is the 1926 36,000 ton design. With uh, 12 12 inch guns in three quadruple turrets. You see, the thing is, I like it. I do like it. It's a lovely looking design. But you have to realize why the French are doing 12 inch and 13 inch guns. It's not because they are, at this point, really focused in on the treaties and treaty limitations. No, it's because of their own infrastructure limitations. Now, would you consider a 36,000 ton fully loaded? Not 36,000 tons in standard displacement, 36,000 tons fully loaded. Ship to be a battle cruiser. It was going to be capable of 
33 knots, although they did consider armoring and building a 16 inch gun version which would only be capable of 27 knots, but that would also only carry six 16 inch guns. And honestly, one of the big problems against that was when they were considering it, there was a fairly decent chance that those 16 inch guns might have ended up being ordered from the United Kingdom. Because French industry had suffered so. Now, it is kind of an interesting thing to think through and think, well, what would have the world been like if this vessel had been built? If the French had built something like this? How would the Italians have reacted? How would the Germans have reacted? Let's be honest, uh, a 33 knot, okay, 12 inch gun ship going around, sounds like a... Sean Horse Killer before the Sean Horse didn't even come into service. But it wasn't a debate. There were a lot of debates, a lot of discussions, a lot of arguments, a lot of complications. Because, you see, when this it's first coming about. Henry Saloon, the chief of the naval general staff in 1926, was actually more concerned with the Trento class of the Italian Navy. You know, those lovely eight-inch cruisers. He felt they posed a considerable threat to metropolitan France, i.e in the western Mediterranean coast and their colonies in North Africa. Such, he started a program which was basically looking at building sort of... You, you could talk about it being a battle cruiser because it is built as a capital ship to counter cruisers. So it does start off in that realm. But I wouldn't say it stays there. It's edging towards fast battleship territory very quickly. And that is that is something you have to consider the French. They are ending up towards fast battleship for rather the similar reasons as the Italian Navy are. That was actually why I... When I was doing the whole discussion in a video not that long ago on what would happen if battlecruisers had been a separate category under the Washington Naval Treaty. I felt that the French and the Italians would quite happily negotiate that way uh, that away with extra tonnage for battleships and go with fast uh, try and build more battleships and build fast battleships. Why? Because by the very nature of agreeing to being the same strength as the Italian Navy, the French have managed to give themselves a rod for their own back. Their only capability to defend both their empire and their position in Mediterranean, if, Italian is, if Italy is in any way, shape or form antagonistic, is to concentrate enough force to match the Italians in the Mediterranean. Makes sense. If you agree, agree by treaty to do so, that you are, if you agree by treaty that you only allow the same level of force as the Italians have, well, you're in trouble. You have to match their force in presence terms in the Mediterranean. Now, under the Washington Treaty, where there's no cumulative tonnage limitation on cruisers, to my mind, that means you build as many cruisers as you can. You don't start using capital ship tonnage for the cruiser role. And, thankfully, someone in the French government actually had this conversation with a saloon and went, 
what are you doing? Or maybe Saloon actually worked it out himself. I don't know, but th that's the interesting thing. You see, there is no cumulative tonnage limitation on the Washington Treaty for vessels built of 10,000 tons or below. So, if you'd have to deal with a threat of cruisers, build cruisers. You might as well. Now, if you think that the Italians are cheating shamelessly, and therefore you need a capital ship to have sufficient tonnage to guarantee a victory, I can understand this. But the trouble is, if you're only going to build two, they're only going to be in two places at once. And if neither of them are able to fight another battleship, you're in trouble. So let's get on this. With the threat of these Italian vessels, they decided that the armor of the initial designs was going to resist 8-inch gunfire, and the guns were going to be concentrated far forward, kind of like the nail rods. It looks almost to an extent some of the early designs like they've literally done a 12-inch quadruple version of the Dunkirks. They literally do have the forward to a quad, to, to a quad turrets with 12-inch guns. Then the Deutschland class are ordered. Ah! That's scary. And they have six 11-inch guns. Or our 283mm guns. And the rest of the French Navy has already been hesitant on the idea of committing their capital ship tonnage to focus purely on beating up Italian cruisers. So then this design comes along, which they basically they take the suffering class of heavy cruisers, which are some of the finest cruiser designs, again, produced in the interwar era. As if you have a look at the suffering class, they really do have wonderfully fine lines and some really interesting balance, even if they have, uh, well, what I would tend to classify as, why did you even bother with that armour? Or, in t naval terms, you could possibly argue just... There is a very good person on YouTube who does this, who just says some armour is just stab me now. Well, the naval equivalent is just shoot me now. <laughs> just, there is no point in me having this armour. It's literally just thick enough that it's going to set off <laughs> the shell when it penetrates. It's not thick enough to prevent the shell from penetrating or doing anything. But the interesting thing is, you take that design, that lovely fine design, and you balance it up. And you go, right then, yeah, we would like a third quadruple turret. Aft. Cool. We'd like it to be capable of 33 knots. Lovely. We'd like it to have some form of armour. Not much, but it has actual armour. Woohoo! That can resist 283mm fire. Gotta love the precision. Yes, it's the 11 inch uh, guns. But, yeah, then there's uh, all sorts of fighting in various government departments, all sorts of issues with funding. The fact that they realize very quickly they're going to have to do a lot of work in their infrastructure to actually be able to build even these themselves. There was even a quick discussion pointed out that they could probably order them in Britain and that might actually work out well for them. Considering they were all looking at British engines for them. And there was always the option the British might might be very nice and go would you like some triple turrets with 16 inch guns in them? Which was considered by some of them as an option. Um, I think they probably still got on the French turrets. I have a feeling if... The exact scenario looked at for going the British route was the British would build the hull with the engines and then it would go across to France for fitting out and building superstructure and putting in the guns and all those things because they had a yard which had the space and could do that. But as has been discussed in many videos, in many books, in many, many articles, 
The French have a uh, habit of literally building up their infrastructure to just build the next generation of ships and then having to rebuild it again for the next generation of that. All doing some very interesting things with the bows. So, then comes along the London Naval Treaties. <laughs> oh, that's good. And, well, the trouble is the British are potentially looking at their progress and development of 14-inch autoloaders. Again, this is a theory which is based in some of the papers which were going around time in places like the... Um, uh, the Na uh, the in uh, the Royal uh, the the Royal Institute of the Naval Architects, etc. Uh, no, it's not that. What, 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 did I, what did I just say? In nice way, I said the completely wrong thing. Let me just check it. It's the Naval Constructors, Royal Institute of Naval Construct. Ah, uh, is it Architects or Constructors again? Just checking the book. Ah. Uh, no, it is Naval Architects. Royal Institute. Uh, it, it was at that time the Institution of Naval Architects, and then it becomes the Royal Institution of Naval Architects later. Sorry, brain fart going on. And well, the, the, do you know that the British are, you know, talking about this idea and are pushing for an idea that maybe it should be twenty-five thousand tons in standard. Again, there's always a different... People talk about them. Well, it was the maximum displacement they're asking. No, it's the maximum displacement standard. Which would cut 10,000 tonnes off it, but would also allow the British... Again, if you think about the the limitations on the t cumulative tonnage, which they wanted to retain the same, it would allow the British to theoretically... Theoretically... Build 21 ships... 21 ships. That's just about enough to meet the British requirements and commitments. And also means that no one's going to be building anything bigger than that. Uh, or rather, no one can really get away with building anything much bigger than 30,000 tons an hour. And claiming it's trying to claim it's 25. Although, in the nicest way, if that had been the treaty limits and people that actually built ships to it. Imagine what happens when Yamato comes out as revealed. Basically, it's a good way to shoot yourself in the foot. But anyway. The French sort of start experimenting around this design. And they sort of sort of working out what they were doing, and then finally the Germans start building the Deutschlands, and so they go right. Then our design has to be able to take a uh, deal with 11-inch guns. So we've got that design again, and they start looking and going. Well, you know, maybe we could work out with the two quadruple turrets forward. And they start off with an idea of 25,000 tons. And then they go with an armament of eight 330mm guns. And that gets us to the Deutschen... Uh, the, the Dunkirks, sorry. So, first thing you're saying is, Alex, of course they're battle cruisers. They're built to hunt down and fight cruisers for their capital ships. Fast light battleships or battle cruisers. You see, the thing is, if they were being built to fight cruisers, purely to fight cruisers, I can honestly see where your argument is coming from. However, they are designed with the ability, 
most importantly, to defeat 283mm guns and also be capable of te defeating the 12 inch guns of the older Italian battleships, which are still in service, the 305mm guns. And that's the thing. They're designed to also be able to fight the older Italian battleships. Now then, the Italians announced they're building the Torios, and the French respond with the Riculus, and the French basically have a panic attack, because they're already building these, and they have to do all sorts of work to upgrade the armour on uh, Strasbourg. But... These are what they're building. They are fast battleships. They're not battle cruisers. As much as they are built to go and attack, you could say, uh, you know, for a German uh, Deutschland class wandering around the world and hoover them up, they really are fast battleships. They're built to fight other battleships. Maybe not necessarily well. When you're talking about Latorios, and I don't think they'd have ever been conceived in a world where a Francisco Caracola exists. I just don't see that happening. But in the world that there was when they were being designed, they were being they were being built as fast battleships. They were supposed to be able to deploy around the world and do the duties they needed to be do. They were also supposed to be something useful for the French. A lot of discussions that go through this talk about the French using them as political discussions, and they, 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 there's a lot of inference going on there. And what I would say is not in the discussions, but the discussions suddenly go around, is building something which is useful for the British. Okay? You have to remember that for the French at this point, there is the reason they're getting behind the 25,000 tons of the British and all these things is because the Royal Navy is critical to them. If we go back to the beginning, they can either defend against the Italians in the Mediterranean or they can defend their empire. They cannot do both under the terms of the treaty. So if you don't have the Royal Navy as your ally, you are schnookered. If you have the Royal Navy as your ally, you can do a bit of both. And basically these are designed to be very attractive to the Royal Navy. They're extra far ships that can do the whole commerce protection duty. Which matters far more to the Royal Navy. Far, far more to the Royal Navy and Britain than it does to the, uh, to the French. Why? Because at this point, Britain still Britain imports a, a large amount of its food, and the global empire is who Britain is. France, the empire is important. It's important for national standing. But food-wise, they're okay. And again, the British are going to have to. If the British, if the British are protecting their trade, they're going to protect the French trade anyway. So there's no need to really worry about it. Unless you want to make yourself useful to the British. And similarly as nations to this day design some of their ships around operating with American carrier battle groups. Why do you do that? Is it in your interest? Do you have a similar carrier battle group? No. But if you're useful to the larger power. If you're seen to be burden sharing with the larger power. They are more likely to burden share with you. And honestly, for the French, if the Royal British come along, if the Royal Navy's there supporting the Marine Nationale, then it doesn't matter what the Italian Navy has. They're going to be swamped. That's the plan. If you think about it from the Royal Navy's calculations, if the French have four or five battleships, in the Mediterranean, and the Italians have six or eight, and the British supply another six. They've just squashed the Italians. They have a numerical superiority in numbers. 
but how many fast ships do the Royal Navy have in this time period? They have Renown, Repulse, and Hood. They also have Tiger wandering around, but she's not long for this world once the London Treaty comes in. So, for Britain, far ships are a premium asset. They have three of them. And they're all battle cruisers. Modernised to an extent, but not as modernised as Renown will be by the time World War II comes around. So, having the Dunkirks, that's a 60% increase in terms of far ship strength for that alliance. That's useful. But they are still not battle cruisers. They're fast light battleships. Actually, just fast battleships. Because, honestly, the problem is that the French are insisting on building everything themselves. And their infrastructure industry can only do so much. It's kind of the same story as when we're talking about Sean Horst and Eisenhower. And people go, oh, they were battle cruisers because they have 11 inch guns or they're this. No. No, 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 no. The size of your gun does not decide whether you're a battle cruiser or a battleship. That is decided by your national infrastructure. If you cannot build a bigger gun than that, you will not have a bigger gun than that. What decides whether you're a battleship or battle cruiser? Doesn't even once you're getting into the fast battleship versus battle cruiser debate. You're talking about in terms of the spectrum. Battleships. Fast battleships. Battle cruiser, one word. Battle cruiser, two word. You're talking this end of the spectrum already. And they're fast battleships. They've, they've sacrificed some of their firepower, some of their speed, uh, some of their armor for speed. But they still have what makes them a fast battleship rather than battle cruiser is the breadth of armor coverage they have. And whether they are the fact that they are armored against equivalent gunfire. And yes, they are. Okay, you could you, you can make a fine go, well, they've got 13-inch guns and they're really armoured against 12-inch guns. But honestly, they are, they are armoured to be impenetrable to 11-inch guns at likely battle ranges. To do decently against 12-inch guns at likely battle ranges and also decently against 13-inch guns at likely battle ranges. That's equivalent fire. The problem comes to them when... A, the London Treaty, the, uh, the sort of that would have stopped guns over 14 inches, etc., and just restricted ships to 25,000 tons doesn't come through, and they've already started building them, and the Italians launch, uh, starting the construction of the oh, Why does the pesky enemy get a vote? It's so annoying. They should just do what we want them to do, shouldn't they? Anyway, Dunkirk class. Now there's a slight difference, a slight difference between Strasbourg and Dunkirk. Not much, but Strasbourg is built after, well, when I say built after, she is Not as far along in her construction when the Italians announce make their announcement, so they can make modifications to her. They were roughly twenty six and a half thousand tons in standard, thirty five and a half thousand tons in deep load. Getting, I think that that's a lot. Well. I will just say this. It is. But you have to remember what the differential between standard and deep load is. It is the displacement of the ship complete, fully manned, 
engined and equipped ready for sea, including all armed and ammunition, equipment, outfit, provisions, and fresh water for crew, miscellaneous stores, and implements of every description that are intended to be carried in war, without fuel or reserve boiler feed water on board. No fuel. No boiler feed water is counted. And when you get into, I don't know, I think it's the next slide I have. Yes, this armor design. And you look around at the things, you look at sort of where they have the armor and where they have the oil and the reserve feed water etc you do start to wonder if the nail rod design inspiration had covered a little bit more just a little bit more than just the concept of the all forward gun armament i mean am i the only one who's thinking yep she's got water for armor This seems to be in the spacing and the way the systems are arranged. The, the water and the liquids are, are going to form a bit of a protective layer. Should help them out. Strasbourg was, as said, heavier. Uh, she was actually um, 27,700 tons in the standard and 36,380 tons at full load. All because of her increased arm protection. I also have to say I, I, I have a similar reluctance to necessarily believe those figures as I do with everyone else with the Washington Treaty battleships in that I... I largely think those fingers are approximates and on paper and we're sure uh, yes this is if everything is exactly as we have specified it and nothing's different rather than necessarily the realities that's also the fact that you know they had differing duties as well Dunkirk was operated usually as a flagship, and her crew and various other things reflect that. Which should also be reflected in her tonnage, which makes it interesting quite how much the differential is between her and Strasbourg. But, you know, life happens. Both of them have... Um, Parsons geared steam turbines. Always useful to get those. And whilst they were designed with and aiming for various high speeds, their actual speed is 29.5 knots. Top speed once they're built. They have indirect boilers, six of them. And those combined with the Parsons steam turbines uh, generate 107,500 shaft horsepower which drives four shafts and four screws. They could do roughly 7,850 nautical miles at 15 knots or 2,450 nautical miles at 28 and a half knots. Now that is useful. That is very useful. If you consider the crossing point between roughly the Lizard in Cornwall, and Ushant, and so sort of from that position to New York, is 2,880 nautical miles. And then again, we, let me re-emphasize, re 2,450 nautical miles at 28 and a half knots, you're pretty much able to cross the entire Atlantic at near enough full speed. And if you take that down a bit, you can go, well, could we do the whole way across the Atlantic at 26 knots? Probably. 
The arm belt was 8.9 inches thick or 225 millimeters. The main deck was 4.5 inches thick or 115 millimeters. The turrets had 13 inches or 330 millimeters thick armor. The conning tower. 10.6 inches or 270 millimeters and well they'd carry two to three float planes now why am I again am I saying two to three float planes well it depends what you mean by float planes in that usually they carried two and they are stored in the uh, they are stored in the hangar have internal elevator etc as well there's another one which is not usually stored fully assembled so you will read some sources which just say they have two aircraft those sources are correct you see some which say they have three aircraft those sources are correct because the third one isn't always assembled so they have they're carrying three aircraft it's just one of them to get it to work is going to require major surgery. And in terms of firepower, they're not badly off. They have the eight 13 inch guns and they're all forward as well. So they can present the most narrow profile of them whilst giving full use of their armament. They have 16 5.1 inch, that's 130 millimeter dual purpose guns. Useful. That is useful. They're in three quadruple and two twin turrets. That, always I have to say, seems a bit strange to me. It's, it's a classic weight saving, but if you've gone to the effort to develop the quadruple turret, and you're satisfied enough of it that you're going to put the entire half quadrant of your ship's defensive fire and ability to defend itself down to those quadruple turrets. One would think one would carry all quadruple turrets, but no, they've got some twin turrets, which seems to me like someone is penny pinching on the weight. I also have to say there were I'm not quite sure about the veracity of this because I was told this by a colleague of mine who is a French historian, but they're actually more usually an army historian than a naval historian. But they claimed they'd seen some design papers which had gone around which had six quadruple 5.1 inch turrets on them, which does interest me. But, um, yeah. They're usually a fairly reliable source. But I am more wonder I'm wondering if they were seeing an earlier design of a Rickaloo rather than necessarily Dunkirk. But it's an interesting idea to think about. Eight thirty seven millimeter, that's one and a half inch AA guns, and thirty two thirteen point two millimeter egg machine guns. If that's what you've got, that's what you've got. So, we've already been over a bit the armour design, but it's worthwhile looking at these ships. Looking at what's actually put in them, and also if you're considering the aspect you're likely to be presenting to your enemy. Your forward aspect. You have a lot of things protecting you. A lot of sacrificial space before you get to anything you're worried about. They're an interesting design. They really are. Their careers... Well... As you might know, that their lifetime, when they end, it's not so good. Dunkirk was in dry dock. 
when the Germans occupied France in November 1942. She'd been badly damaged during Mez al Kabir. And Strasbourg had escaped to Toulon and become the flagship of uh, the forces de haute mer, the high seas forces of the Vichy regime. But she's also scuttled in Toulon. Both ships were handed over to the Italians, uh, who then would break them up and their hulks are actually bombed by American aircraft in 1944. Eventually they're self-scrapped again in 1950. It's just, that's a terrible end for them. And when we consider these ships were in service from 1937 onwards, it's rather... It's rather a letdown for ships which had started off with quite a promising career. Now, Dunkirk is commissioned in 1936, but you have to consider, again, the French have a different system than the British and the Americans, and it's closer to the German system, in that she commissions, and then she goes on extensive testing and evaluation trials. Yeah. While she's technically still going through these trials, in May 1937, she goes to the naval review of the coronation of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth. That's the lady who, for most of the most of the um, last century, was known as the Queen Mother. simple scenario because both her and her daughter were Queen Elizabeth but one was the Queen as in the ruler of the country and sitting on the throne and one was a Queen Consort and because no one kept saying Queen Elizabeth and Queen Consort Elizabeth uh, it was converted into Queen's mo a Queen Mother sort of going the Queen's Mother well hang on no she was a Queen as well oh or we go with Queen Mother. And off topic, but worthwhile thinking about, because she's technically still going through trials and is sent to represent you at a naval review for a not inauspicious occasion, because she's your most modern capital ship. It's problematic, to say the best. Uh, the best. And then we have, well, Dunkirk, she's officially in service in September 1938, which coincidentally is also when, two weeks before Strasbourg is actually commissioned. And she enters service in April 1939. So she also has some testing and evaluation after she's technically commissioned. I would say again with both of them the problem is these are the first battleships which France has built for a long time and their infrastructure has and you look at the ships they were building before these we have the Lyon excellent a little unconventional but excellent you have the Normandies the least said about them the better and you have the others before the Normandies, and the less said about them get makes things even better. So, honestly, they haven't had, since they started going down the Dreadnought battleship position, that good an experience. So these are astounding. They really are astoundingly good for the scenario around them, the complexity of the scenario around them. When the Sudetenland crisis 
hits in April 1939. Dunkirk is sent to, uh, to cover the Jeanne d'Arc, the training cruiser, which was returning from the Caribbean. Why? Because there's a nearby German squadron, and they felt that the Jeanne d'Arc would be slaughtered if it ran into that squadron. Quite honestly. And that would be a national embarrassment. So the Dunkirk goes out. And that is interesting to me because it tells you one reason why the French continued this. Because these were the out-of-area ships. The Riculus are about the Italians. These start off as wandering between various roles. Yes, they are designed and they're capable of taking on the older Italian battleships. But also, I strongly have a feeling that if war had held off for a little bit longer and the Riculus had ended service, I have this feeling you would find Dunkirk and Strasbourg deployed far and wide. They might even be in the Far East. Why do I say that? Because these vessels are the perfect vessels for such deployments. They are a battleship, so they carry that status. They look good. They're also not very strong battleships, and they're not, you know, Japan can't go, oh, you are amassing massive forces on our doorstep. This is a, this is a Casus Belli. We must fight to defend ourselves. It's got 13-inch guns. And it's titchy. I mean, honestly, the Spanish dreadnoughts, the Spanish dreadnoughts couldn't have held off up in a fight against them. So, but that's not really saying anything. Frankly, HMS Dreadnought could probably have taken on all three of the Spanish dreadnoughts and still have won. But we'll leave that to one side. I am talking about HMS Dreadnought as in Dreadnought herself, even though the Spanish ships are built after her. They are interesting. An interesting design. They do represent the absolute best, uh, the absolute best fit for Spanish needs, but no one was scared of them. No one who had a battleship, anyway. Um, I think th there was a joke which was going around when the South American arms race was going on, and they were building their ships. And then the Spanish were building their ships, and it was a case of... No longer the most powerful Spanish-speaking country in the world, are you? Although, of course, the fact is, Brazil definitely built more, battle uh, more dreadnought battleships than Portugal did. But for some reason, the British are never as rude about the, or the Portuguese as they are the Spanish. Probably the old alliance. But leave that to one side. The point is, these ships, and I know I'm wandering a bit this evening, but I'm trying to give you some context on these ships. In terms of what are they for? They're still battleships. The Spanish ships, Spanish dreadnoughts were still battleships. No one called them a battle cruiser because they were smaller than HMS Dreadnought and terrible. They were still built as a battleship. They are a battleship. These are battleships. And I think they would have been the distant operations one. They would have been the presence ones doing this, the job in the Far East if they after the recluse entered service. That is where they'd have ended up. Now, after they get the Jean d'Arc home, she and Strasbourg, Dunkirk and Strasbourg, meet up, and they are designated the first battle division. And then they go and visit Portugal. And then do a tour of Britain. It's a good way to build up agree alliances and agreement, isn't it? It's to send the ships round to do a tour. Then they took part in exercises off the coast of Brittany. <laughs> and finally, Britain and France formalised their agreements of who's covering where in the world. 
The French would cover Allied shipping in the Central Atlantic. The British would cover Allied shipping in the North Atlantic and the South Atlantic. But the Central Atlantic, that would be the French area. And, immediately, which ships are sent there? Dunkirk and Strasbourg. Their duties, hunt down commerce raiders. Eventually, when war has begun and they start doing those duties, they decide that actually their best bet is splitting up. With the Dunkirk operating out of Brest, with the Burn as its assistance, or Shackle, depending on your perspective, and the Strasbourg operating out of Dakar, that's in French West Africa all the time, along with HMS Hermes. There are very few scenarios where I would say a ship was lucky to get Hermes as its assistant ship. But if I had to pick between the Burn and the Hermes, I would pick the Hermes every day of the week. And she's a very good carrier for the cruiser role, because to accept, that's what she's been built as. She's built for the Chromos protection role. She's not built as a strike carrier. That's... We're talking about the first British purpose-built carrier... The first purpose-built carrier to be launched and completed. The Japanese technically started earlier. But still, she's good, and she is. She's built for this role. She was built to be a spotting carrier for battleships. She was built to be a reconnaissance carrier for battle cruisers to basically point them and shoot uh, point those, those battle cruisers where they need to go using her aircraft to scout for the targets and working with a fast battleship like the Strasbourg was perfect in November 1939 Dunkirk backed up Hood while hunting for Scharnhorst and Neisenau. Unfortunately, they were unable to locate them, but it came close. And that would have been quite an interesting scenario, because these ships, Dunkirk and Strasbourg, had literally been built to fight 11-inch guns. To, and they would be facing their 11-inch armed contemporary battle fast battleships in their in that original form so it would have been an interesting fight a very interesting fight and I keep saying and Sharnos and Eisenhower wouldn't have been able to get away from that fight they'd have had to fight it so either way they lose because they either get damaged and preyed down by something else, or they get beaten in that fight. Not long after that, Strasbourg is recalled from Dakar, and they decide they're going to pair up again into a force to rad. That was what they were called earlier on when they were paired up as well, but once they've been split up, it was technically divided. Their duties were to carry a shipment of um, gold reserves to Canada and also escort a troop convoy to Britain in December. They then go to Mediterranean in 1940 to try and deter war with Italy or prepare for it, depending on your perspective. They were almost sent to the Norway campaign in April 1940, but with Italy being Italy, the French decided to keep the Mediterranean. It's rather interesting what if, again, if they had been sent up there, because the timeline means that they might well have run into Scharnhorst and Eisenhower. And that could be, again, another interesting scenario, Scharnhorst and Eisenhower versus Strasbourg and Dunkirk. They were based at Merzel Kabir 
to basically try and deter the Italians. And when the Battle of France ends, they're still at Mirza Kabir. Now, I've done videos about Mirza Kabir and the other things there, but basically, that is just not a good scenario, and I'm going to leave that to those videos. And I'm also going to leave the scuttling at Toulon to other videos. But the thing is, they were an active part of World War II before they weren't. And they were a very useful part of it. And you can see their role quite quickly going on in what they are for. What their duties are. It's a sad way they end. Because these ships had a lot of potential. They had a lot of capability. They are good little battleships. And they were useful little battleships. Honestly, the Royal Navy would probably not have been worried, or as worried, about the French Navy if it hadn't been for their heavy cruisers and these. These were the assets which the Royal Navy really worried about getting into German or even Italian hands. Them and their heavy cruisers. Everything else could be managed. These have capabilities. As I was talking earlier, they can get all the way across the Atlantic at high speed. Coupled up that with some tankers having got out uh, through the northern passages or elsewhere, that's a problem. They are fast enough that in the early days, before proper forces are in place, they could have theoretically rushed straight to Gibraltar. They could have rushed the Straits. And there's not much that could have stopped them. So they are what the Royal Navy worries about. Because they're so useful for the Royal Navy as these far ships. But it also means they're a threat, because if you consider it another way. They are 60% of the far ships at the Royal Navy's at the British and Allied disposal when the France falls. King George V is just about getting uh, get heading towards operation. Renown repulse. Renown is out of her refit. Repulse and Hood need to go into the refits, but they can't, because they need their fast ships. A legacy of the treaties, a legacy of all sorts of issues, they don't have enough fast ships, and these were critical assets then. These are essential assets for Britain, but they're also scary assets, because if you consider, if the worst happened and they did end up in German control the British know how good they are these are the real deal in terms of an efficient fast battleship they're certainly more capable than Channel and Eisenhower and the damage they do in their operations that's worrying enough They're good ships. So we've got coming up right then. Well, next week is the seventh of November. Unrotated projectiles to hypersonic missiles. I think I'm re-recording that because I've got a couple of versions of it worked on, but I'm I think I'm going to re-record it. I looked through it earlier. I'm not as happy with it. I think some of my um, points aren't as well developed as they need to be. But it should be interesting. 
anyway, thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And yeah, this is a series which was supposed to be 20 minute videos, and this has just been a little bit over now when it's done. I always finish with a question, and honestly, I'd like to do two questions. I'd like to do what do you, how do you think the world changes if the French decide to build the larger ship, and they build two of them? They could sort of get it through if they were prepared to get rid of some of their ships in uh, sort of the the larger quadruple twelve inch ships. Do you agree with me that no one would call those battle cruisers? And secondly, let's say they're not in Merzel Kabir when France falls. Let's say Strasbourg and Dunkirk are in Gibraltar. Not sure why, but let's say they're there. How do you think World War II changes if they're in Gibraltar? And either interned, as the forces are like Alexandria, or convert to free French. Which, Dunkirk's crew especially, could have been a possibility. Strasbourg's crew, I think, they, I'm not saying they're any less patriotic. I'm saying they seem to be, from the write-ups, far more rule-following, waiting for orders from above. The Dunkirk crew seem to, in that period, be far more spirit rather than letter of the rules. But that's just my impressions from the limited sources I've read, because, as I've said before... I'm good at engineering French. I'm not necessarily good at personal French. Thank you very much for watching, and hope you enjoyed.